name is Brittany, like Susan said, from Seniors Blue Book. And um, Susan, you did a great job of introducing, basically we provide education and resources for anybody truly who needs them um, from private duty home health to a resource like Freya, doctors, uh, specialties, um, any kind of not-for-profit in the area that an aging adult would need. Um, a lot of free resources and then also, you know, senior living communities and many other things, anything again that would help somebody as a resource as they age and need those. So um, if you ever have any questions or need anything, Susan can also provide my email address. Uh, I've been in the industry about 12 years now and going on 13 and happy to help anybody however I can. Um, so today um, we have, I'm very excited, we have Freya Robbins um, in the house. As you can see, Freya, do a little dance, do a little jig. There she is. <laughs> um, I usually come with a yeah, I usually come with a joke and I, I did not. So next time I'll come with a great joke for you guys. Um, I used to try to be funny at Parkinson Place in person. Try is the key word. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about Freya, um, a little introduction. So Freya was trained as a mediator after a devastating litigated divorce. She was emotionally, financially, and spiritually injured because of the adverse that is a, that's a big word, adversarial <laughs> nature of the legal process with attorneys and the court system. As a result, shortly after her divorce, Freya decided to become certified as a mediator to help other people avoid the heartbreak that she's experienced. Freya attended 13 schools in her 12 years of grade school through high school years. That's a lot, Freya. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a sexual abuse survivor, a bone cancer survivor, and she has a son with intractable epilepsy. Despite the hurdles she's faced in her own life, Freya has chosen to work with families since 2003, assisting them with family issues, whether it's a separation, challenges with children, aging parents, or anything else that is family related. So um, without further ado, this is Freya Robbins from Zollinger Mediation, and I'll let you take it from here and happy to have you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you to Parkinson Place for having me. I have uh, a grandfather who had Parkinson's disease. And I've had several clients uh, also who had Parkinson's uh, disease as well and cared for both of my parents as they aged. Helped my father get um, Medicaid qualified and helped my mom a couple of years ago who had cancer. Um, it was about six months from the time that she was diagnosed till she passed. And I was very fortunate to be able to move into her home, who we had moved her here to Sarasota. And I stayed with her for about six months. Um, and then hospice came in at the end. So uh, I feel blessed to have had all of these opportunities that I've had in life, because that's really what's made me stronger. And that's what's helped me to be able to help um, my clients. So today we're going to talk about how to learn how to improve relationships using positive techniques. So let's break this uh, title down, learn. What does learn mean? It means to gain knowledge or understanding or skill by study, instruction, or experience. So today I'll give you a little instruction we might even talk about doing some experience today. Improve, the word improve means to gain knowledge or understanding of our skill by study, instruction, or experience. Relationships. So we're talking about improving these relationships, right? Uh, a relationship is a connection or a binding a participant in a relationship, such as a kinship, maybe a family member, or it might be a romantic or a passionate attachment, but relationships can also be our work relationships, or maybe even someone that we have, you know, not a close connection with, but certainly a connection with. You might have a relationship with the cashier at the grocery store. Uh, positive, the word positive means contributing toward or characterized by increase or progression. So that means it's supposed to get better, not worse, right? <laughs> and then techniques is a method of accomplishing 
a desired aim. So we're going to use some techniques. So what is the aim or purpose of this? Like really, who cares? Does anybody care about conflict? I care. I care. I care if you have conflict in your life. I care if I have conflict in my life. Do you know what? I love to help people with their conflict. I spend all day doing it. You know what I don't like? Personally, I don't like conflict. Like if I have to deal with conflict I'm in my life, personally, I really detest it. I avoid it. I do not like conflict at all. So I'd like to help you with your conflict. Think for a moment about the people in your life. Think about someone that you have loved, maybe who's no longer there. Maybe it's someone who's passed away. And like I said uh, to you a few minutes ago, my mom passed away. What comes to your mind when you think about someone who's passed away? Do you have pleasant thoughts of them? I think of my mother. I think of how much I loved her and how I wish I could talk to her again today. How I can keep that conversation and that relationship going with her, to communicate with her, to laugh with her, to be silly, just to, I would call her at the end of my day, every day and tell her what was going on with my day. And I think about that wonderful relationship because in the end, is it about the things or is it about the relationships? It's not about the things, is it? Is it about the fancy cars or a nice home or expensive jewelry? No, I think most of us would say those things don't matter. The juice of life is really made up of the myriad of relationships that we experience, right? So our relationships work. Yeah, they certainly can be. <laughs> that is if they're worth having. Now that said, there might be some relationships that should not even happen and should be ended even. But that's a subject for another presentation. We're not gonna talk about that today. Let's stay focused on improving the relationships and using the positive techniques. So what do you think is the problem with most relationships anyway? Misunderstanding, don't you think? Truly, it's an unintentional communication which causes problems if it's not discussed and resolved. Because you can have a misunderstanding with someone and no one ever says anything, right? And it just sort of builds and it builds and it builds. A disagreement is where two parties have totally differing opinions and they genuinely don't agree, right? So they're different. A misunderstanding is different than a total disagreement. And it helps how you decide to handle conflict. Raise your hand if you like conflict. I'm looking. I can't hear you, but I can see every one of you. I don't see one hand raised. Nope, nobody. Nobody likes conflict. Imagine that. But yet we find ourselves in conflict. Richard, did you raise your hand? Or were you wiping your nose? <laughs> now he's laughing. I saw your hand move. All right. So suffice it to say, I don't think many of us really like conflict. What is dispute resolution? I practice every day a method called dispute resolution. It's a way to resolve conflict in a healthy manner. What's unhealthy? fighting, saying nasty things, hurting someone else's feelings just to get back at them because we're hurt, right? It's true. Hurt people hurt people, unfortunately. So it doesn't really do any good to hurt someone because all they're going to do is then hurt someone else. Like we say to children, or at least I said this to my children growing up, I have two who are now 29 and 26. It's never about what happens to you. 
it's always about how you handle that, which happens to you, right? So just because the kid kicked you in the shin doesn't give you permission to go punch him in the face. You might be upset with him, but that's not really going to resolve the conflict. Might make you feel better temporarily, but it's probably going to cause more conflict, right? Because you're going to end up in timeout or maybe not in school anymore. When we make mistakes, it's okay. We're going to make mistakes. And even the right thing to do is to make amends, right? If we make a mistake, to fix it, to go back and fix it. We had a rule in our house when my kids were growing up that if they hurt anybody or broke anything, they had to come back, they had to apologize, they had to say they were sorry, like they meant it. And they would have to say they weren't going to do it again. And then if it were the two kids, they would have to hug. And if they, and the way they made amends was by apologizing, but if they broke something or ruined something, they would have to pay for it or fix it. So that was the rule in our house. And they didn't always like that, but they grew to appreciate the fact that hugging one another and saying, I'm sorry, really caused it to be more personal. And I, I truly think that I'm sorry goes a long way. And I try to use those words with my team at my office and also with my family. So when having a conversation with someone that you are intent on having a good relationship with, it's important to make sure that you are understanding what it is they're really saying and what they're feeling. I don't know if you guys know about this, but you probably do. The practice of repeating what someone said, but in your own words, to affirm that you understood them is one way to improve a relationship. We call that reframing, right? Give them a second chance to tell you if that is what they really meant. So someone says something, you repeat back, is this what you said? And they say, no, like you got it all wrong. <laughs> You're, here you are trying to understand them and to hear them and you reframe it. And they say, no, that's not what I said at all. And, and I work with couples every day and almost every time someone will, I, I help them practice this and I say, you say what you need to say. Now, what did you hear him or her say? And oftentimes they'll say, well, that's not what I said at all. Okay, well, you say it again, give them another opportunity. And then they'll go, oh, dude, you said this. And they go, yes, like you got it. Like you heard me. We all want to be heard. We just want to be heard. We want to, we want to be listened to. We want to know that we matter, that what we say matters in the world, and especially to that person who's sitting across from us. So let's walk through an example. You're dealing with a small child who is crying. You calm them down enough at least to have a conversation. Then you say, what is it you're upset about? They say to you, my mommy is sick and they start to cry again. And you repeat what they said in your own words. You said, you're upset because your mommy's sick, right? Are you worried about her? Then they say, no, that's not it. I'm upset because my daddy's gonna be mad at me because mommy gets sick all the time when she drinks. I'm worried about my dad getting mad. He gets really mad. That puts a whole new light on the issue, doesn't it? We thought the small child was upset and worried about mommy. The child really wasn't worried about mommy. The child was worried about themselves because of how the parents were handling the conflict or not handling the conflict. Here's another example. Your mate 
has just come in the door from work and you can tell they're in that bad mood again. You say, hi, honey, how was your day? You get back a grunt and a moan and then comes the string of, well, this happened and that happened and then so-and-so did this and, and, and so-and-so did nothing to stop it and on and on and on. And you, being the fix-it person that you are, start with giving advice because you hate to see your mate frustrated. You see this day after day and you're just trying to help them. They stop and say, you aren't listening. Well, you're shocked because you know exactly how they're feeling. You hear it every day, right? And you're trying to solve it for them because you can't stand seeing them frustrated like this. Well, here's an idea that might help. When you're faced with a situation like this, you might say to your mate, do you need me to just listen to you? Or do you want me to give you some advice? What do you think they're gonna say? More times than not, they will say, no, I just want you to listen to me. I don't need advice. We all want to be heard. And I would have to say that if I were, if I were looking, if I were trying to differentiate the, the, uh, the roles, oftentimes the husband, men typically are more fix it kind of people. And they want to, they want help. They want to fix it. And the wife wants to be heard. And regardless of what role you play in that relationship, it might be the other way around, but oftentimes it's one who wants to be heard and the other one who is trying to fix it. And in, in our interest, our desire is to, is to help, but we don't realize that trying to fix it isn't going to solve the problem. Did you ever hear the story of the, story of the man who's sitting on the front porch with his dog who is yelping? The neighbor walks by and says, why is your dog yelping like that? The dog owner says, oh, his paw is caught on a nail. The neighbor says, well, I wonder why he doesn't just move off the nail. The dog owner says, oh, he says it doesn't hurt bad enough to move. It only hurts bad enough to complain about it. So how many of us are like that? We don't want to do anything about it. We just want to complain about it, right? So Gary Chapman's book on the five love languages. I love to talk about this. And I don't know how many of you know about Gary Chapman's book, but he has a wonderful book on the five love languages. And the five love languages are personal touch or physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, and quality time. So I'll go over those again. Physical touch, men, you know, that's you. Some women too. Words of affirmation, that's saying kind things, uplifting people, encouraging them. Acts of service, someone gets something for you, waits on you, does a little errand for you. Gifts, those are real gifts someone buys. They don't have to be expensive, but a gift, giving someone a gift. And the other one is quality time. I know clearly when I look at these, what of those five are important to my husband? And I know what of those five are important to me. And in relationships, it's important to know not just what is your love language. I know what, I know what's important to me but who's across the table from me? What do they need? And are we speaking the language of the person across the table from us? Whether that's, you know, someone you're in a close relationship with or not. I have been involved in sales over the years. And even though I can be, you know, a delightful, chatty kind of person. 
I knew when I had someone across the table from me that was a bottom line engineer type, right, Richard? I needed to get to the bottom line. I needed to tell him what it was, what he needed, how much it was gonna cost, the short answer. He wanted to know what time it was. He didn't want to know how to build the watch. And I had to deliver that to him. If I didn't deliver it to him, I would lose him. So we have to think about who is our audience. I know with an audience like this, I can't, I can't speak to everyone's needs, but when you're one-on-one -on -one with someone, it's really important to know. And in my mediation, the style of mediation that I do, I have two people across the table from me. So I often think um, it's like being on stage <laughs> a bit because I'm handling the emotion from this person and the emotion from this person. And I'm also handling legal matters and financial matters, but it's important for me to know who am I dealing with? What are their emotions? What are their likes and dislikes? So I think that's, um, it's very important for us to know who it is we're dealing with and how important it is, is it for us to know who, who that is and how we can speak their language. Another thing that I like to use in my mediation is, do you know what the difference is between interest and position? Oftentimes people come to the mediation table with a strong feeling. And sometimes that feeling is a feeling of position. So I'll, I'm gonna use divorce just because I deal with that a lot. And she said, I want the house. I want the house. She wants the house. <laughs> That's a position. Now, if she said to me, oh, I'm so worried about my children. I don't want them to have to leave the house. It's all they've known. That's an interest. Now I hear her heart. I know what her interest is. Her interest is in protecting her children. It's about safety. It's about continuity. But if she comes in and says, I want that house, that's a position. If he says to me, I'm not giving up my retirement. I worked for that, it's mine. That's a position. If I say, tell me what your concern is, he might say, I've worked my butt off my whole life. How come I have to give it? I didn't really, am I gonna be okay? What's gonna happen to me in retirement? It's oftentimes it's that not knowing you know, the answer to the problem, which I call being in limbo, but uh, limbo is from the moment you know you have a problem till the problem's resolved. <laughs> and nobody likes to be in limbo. Nobody likes to be in that place of the unknown. And sometimes that's why we'll, we'll choose the same thing, even though the same thing is a, a repetition of insanity but it's because it's familiar to us. And sometimes we'll accept familiarity before we will accept the opportunity for change, even though that change might be uncomfortable. Um, one more last story of uh, an example of position and, and interest and, and not knowing. So the, a man and a woman were having a heated argument over the oranges. He wanted them and she wanted them. He offered her apples, that wasn't gonna solve the problem. She offered him pears, that wasn't gonna solve his problem. Neither one was able to come to an agreement that they believed to be fair. After the situation was over and in reviewing what had happened, it was revealed that the one person wanted the inside of the orange to make juice with and the other person wanted the outside of the orange to make zest with for cooking. But nobody got to the point of what was their interest? What did they need? And so they fought over something that they didn't even understand they were really fighting over. So when I work with people, I try to help them get to that point to find out what really, what is your interest? What is your concern? Because if we can, if we can talk honestly with people and figure out what their concern is, we can usually find a resolution to it. Anyway, so questions, 
I don't even know if I've gone over my time or how much time we have left, but no. I could talk about this stuff for days. <laughs> well, you're you're fine. So um, let, I'm going to put us back in gallery. I think it's probably the best. There we go. Okay, so I can see everyone. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I will call your name and, and we can begin. If you if you'd like and you'd feel more comfortable to put it in the chat room, feel free to also type it in the chat room and I'll be glad to um, also go that way. Anybody have any questions? All right, I have a question. <laughs> Good. I love it when people have questions. <laughs> Why do we tend to sometimes gravitate to the same people, the same personalities, and sometimes they may not be the most healthy? Well, um, again, it's that familiarity. So when you when we think about, um, if you go back to your family of origin, you think about the challenges that you've had in relationships, and I'm sure all of us can. I, I think about my own self and some of the challenges that I had in my in my family. I was I was actually as a little girl, I was mediating my my parents' issues. My my mom and dad were together in the park. I think Brittany started saying that I went to 12 schools in 13 years. I did. And most people would say military family, and it's like no dysfunctional family. But I actually grew up in a very dysfunctional family. And I saw my parents not getting along and I was trying to help resolve that conflict with them so they weren't arguing. And so I was actually doing this kind of work as a child. I didn't even know, I didn't know until I was 46 years old that there was a business that could help people. And that's when I started my practice after I had, um, I'd gone through a very difficult divorce. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I can actually help people. They don't have to go see attorneys. They don't have to litigate. They don't have to hurt one another. They don't have to damage their kids emotionally anymore. Oh my goodness. It, I spent hundreds, well, it was over a hundred thousand dollars for a litigated divorce. And it just, it's so sad to see that that goes on every single day in, in cities everywhere. And families are devastated. And I just felt like if there was something I could do to help that, I would. But it's that we like familiarity because it's what we know. And oftentimes because of that, as adults, we recreate relationships that are similar. Like the joke is always, you either married your mother or your father. Like, I don't know who you married, but you either married your mom or your dad. And whichever one you see in your, in your new relationship, it's oftentimes a relationship that you're trying to fix. You're trying to recreate that relationship you had as a child that you never could get right. And it wasn't your fault. It was probably a combination of things that that relationship went awry and you're trying the best you can to recreate it. But we do it all the time, all the time. Um, and oftentimes I counsel my clients who are in, let's just say they're going out of a relationship. They're they're divorcing someone who has um, maybe an addictive personality um, disorder. Maybe they, they have a drug addiction. Maybe they have narcissism. Maybe they're abusive. Um, but people tend to repeat that cycle unless they get help. And I'm, I am such a proponent of counseling. I've, I've had counseling throughout my life. I've now I have an honorary certificate and uh, counseling. <laughs> I would get my counseling certification, except I, you know, they probably would walk away and say, Freddie, you're, you already know all that because I've had so much counseling myself, but um, through lots and lots and lots and lots of therapy, I made lists and became very aware of who was right for me and who was wrong for me because I kept, you know, I, I say my picker was broken because I kept picking the wrong one. <laughs> uh, but I finally realized who were the unhealthy people for me in my life and who were the healthy people. And that we have to make a conscious choice of that. I literally for years had a, had a white piece of paper on the back of my bedroom door that my counselor helped me make. And it said every single thing, every requirement of a man 
that, that had the privilege of being in my life. And after my divorce, I was single for, I think it was like 12 or 13 years while I was raising my children and building my practice. And um, my husband today, who we've been married for a little over five years, he's husband number three, he's the last one, there will be no other. I finally got it right after three, but he, every one of those characteristics that's on that list is my husband, except one, he's not a dancer, but that was not a deal breaker. That was not a deal breaker to me that it would have been nice, but it wasn't, it wasn't important. Honesty, integrity, kindness, the moral values were what were important to me and someone that didn't have addictions. So it just, it's, a, it takes a lot of work. It's a good question, but it's human nature to repeat. And, and it takes real work to not do that repeating. Mm 